This week on Deep Space Pride, a gay Star Trek podcast, we have a special guest, Callie Wright, host and producer of Queer Splaining, and also a member of the Lambda Quadrant. And we're going to discuss Prodigal Daughter, Deep Space Nine's Season 7, Episode 11's episode, and also uh, all things uh, queer in Star Trek. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Johnson. Hey, Mike. How are you? I am good. How are you? I'm annoyed that we're recording this for a second time, but here we are. <laughs> That's fine. Great call out. That's hey, your wonderful. dog. Your dog won't shut the I fuck up. I can do anything about this. All right. Well, here we are. Well, you know, we're doing okay. Your dog, I don't know what's going on with him, but, you know, that's fine. I think he is very excited about the conversation we're about to have. He has no doubt has very strong feelings about queer stuff in Trek. He does. Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. And that voice you hear, everyone, is our guest this week. Callie Wright, who's the host and producer of Queer Explaining, and also a member of Lambda Quadrant. And just to give everyone a little context, we met Callie in Chicago at the Mission Chicago Star Trek convention back in early April. And uh, they were on a panel along with uh, three or four other queer people who were talking about Star Trek. And uh, I think it was called the LGBTQ plus collective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So welcome, Callie. And thanks for coming on. I know we talked about this for a long time and we finally been able to make this happen. Thank you. And Callie, I love having you here. Um, Mike and I really did enjoy that panel. And first of all, we are just we were just very excited to be at a convention where there was LGBTQ representation on a panel and as Mike was saying early before we started recording, it was great to see that there was standing room only at the panel. And I love just how we just have so much representation in terms of fandom and being able to talk about so many different topics and for different people to just have different takeaways from different episodes and different characters that I don't have or Mike doesn't have. And it was just so interesting. I really liked it a lot. And, you know, thank you for being part of that. And that's why I wanted to have you here. You know, we just wanted to uh, just talk to you about your experience and your fandom, how you've experienced fandom and how you experienced Trek. And yeah, you know, like just happy to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that panel was something special because I I mean, I've done a lot of panel discussions and I... I haven't walked away from literally any of them thinking like, oh, that was awful. You know what I mean? But obviously it's, Mm -hmm. you kind of never know what, when you have a panel and it's not celebrity hosted, you just kind of never know. And, um, you know, I've done a lot of panels that I felt good about, but we're still like pretty low key. Uh, the energy was very much like we're having a conversation, we're educating each other, that kind of stuff. And that is great. I want to like it 0%. Am I talking shit about that? But, that panel had a special kind of just like fun energy to it that I don't think I've had at a different panel before. Um, everybody was just so like happy. Like it wasn't even just a matter of like, Oh, we're talking about queer stuff in star Trek. It was like, there was just a, a kind of like fun, maybe mischievous. I don't know. Like it was just, there was so much good energy in that room. And that's just like, yeah, I'll, I'll carry it with me forever. It was fantastic. Yeah, I think we were all super excited just to be in company with one another, you know, to be at a convention, to be at a, for us, this was our first official Star Trek convention, mm-hmm. like, you know, as far as being supported by Paramount Plus slash CBS Studios, whatever you want to call it at mm-hmm. this point. Um, so was, I think that was part of the energy was just the people who were there had been so, it had been so long since we had had a convention. Mm-hmm. You know, and a good one, you know, 
other, you know, we, we talked a little bit of off air about, you know, some of the, the foibles of, of the convention itself, but overall, I think there's just a great experience to be around other Trek fans like that. And, in, in a, in a way that was just open and supportive and, to hear you and the other panelists talk about your fandom and Star Trek and and specifically about the episode that we're going to talk about today, which is Prodigal Daughter. Um, but you brought all of that into, into that panel and it was just, uh, it was it was exciting. It was exciting to see that and to have that space and have it be on the main calendar of the convention. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you got invited to that and like how that all came about? Yeah, that panel specifically uh, was put together by uh, a friend of mine named Jackson, who I met. Uh, I'm going to be honest and say I don't remember exactly where we met, but it was in a, a queer Star Trek group. <laughs> one of the many that I'm a part of on like Facebook or Twitter or something like that. And they just reached out and said, hey, I'm putting together a panel proposal for Chicago and uh you know, you have cool stuff to say about Star Trek and is it cool if I like add you to a group chat so we can talk about it. And uh, unfortunately, they had uh, they had their their COVID booster a day or two before the con and they were feeling bad. So they actually weren't able to make it to the panel that they put together, which is very oh, sad because uh, they are also just an amazingly smart, insightful, funny person, like a very, very much missed having them on the panel. Um, but yeah, it was, it was that group chat and that was how I met, uh, all the other folks that were on the panel. I had never met them in person before that. And I don't think that I had talked to any of those folks, um, directly, uh, in any significant way before we were brought together. But, uh, you know, they did a really good job. Like they, you know, there was a Google doc and there was a spreadsheet and all kinds of stuff where we were talking about it. And that's, uh, yeah, um, I love spreadsheets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, and, uh, so yeah, like all credit to those folks too. Like it was, it was very well put together. It was a very smart and insightful group of folks that I was super, super stoked to get to share the stage with, especially, you know, the, the, the in-person interactions. I think that was, uh, I think that was all of our first time meeting each other. Like, I think some of the other folks knew each other a little better than I had, um, but I'm not sure about how much they, you know, had interacted IRL before that. Uh, but yeah, really, really cool group of folks. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I we walked out of there very excited and just, uh, I, you know, more aware of the community out there. So it was, uh, it was a great experience. And then uh, you, I, I think I tweeted at you right away and said thank you for that. Um, we'd love to have you on, and you were super responsive. And then we met up and. Uh, you you so met up with me on the show floor and you asked me what episode do you think and I was like Prodigal Daughter and you were like wait a minute I've never heard anyone say that before we have to talk about that which I'm very excited about <laughs> yeah well no I, 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 it's great to have someone know what they want to talk about and uh, lead the dis- you know help us lead the discussion because I think uh, for me personally you know I'm I'm still continuing to educate myself on on uh queerness in general and and becoming comfortable more and more comfortable with the word queer um Mm -hmm. but also just uh learning more about the diversity of our lgbtqia community uh so i'm excited for this discussion um yeah and what i thought was interesting as part of that panel because you all did talk about prodigal daughter just a little bit was that you know i i i would say two years ago i did a ds9 rewatch and Prodigal Daughter is one of those episodes where if we're just looking at it like face value in the span of season seven, it doesn't necessarily add that much to what is really going on. Obviously, the, the main narrative driver of season six, season seven is the Dominion War and what's going on. And you basically have this like side quest with Esri and her family and... I'll be honest, this is not one of my favorite episodes. I thought that it was kind of boring, to be honest. I recent, I actually just rewatched it yes today. I fell asleep because I was also, I was also tired. I was tired. I was tired. I had just eaten dinner, but you know, it was like it's just one of those those shows where there was like a lot. It's like it's about the the drama, some of the family yeah. drama, and like the the goings the goings ons of the drama, and then there's a little bit of mystery, and then 
you know, if you're just looking at the face value of the narrative, it's like, oh, like, you know, there's all this, the darkness in the, the dark belt underbelly of the family mm-hmm. and one of the sons is like a murderer, like all this shit. Spoilers, by the way, <laughs> if, if, for those <laughs> listeners that haven't yeah. seen this episode. Um, but it's just yeah. really interesting to hear you all talk about on the panel because I think one of the great things about the diversity that is the Trek community is that we all just have different perspectives and we celebrate different perspectives and we all just come into Trek um, looking for different things and wanting different things out of it. Some people just want to be entertained, which is great, you know, and some people like sci-fi elements, the hard sci-fi elements of Trek. And, you know, I'm, I'm more of a, like a nerd geek type. So sometimes I really geek out when, you know, like, I'm reading the Star Trek technical manual and that really excites me. Like that shit really excites me. <laughs> Same. You know what I mean? Like, and yep. when they like, I love like when they like talk about like the hardcore science and they, you know, in the, in the, um, in, in the way that Star Trek makes science work. I love that mm-hmm. shit. Um, and I think for, it was great to just hear you talk about Prago Daughter, which in my mind is a middling episode um, relatively speaking, yeah, but not you had such a different episode. experience. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think that it, even in the, back say, heard, the background, yeah. Sorry, I, go ahead. I, I will say I I heard Nikki DeBoer talk about the episode once, and I don't think she is very fond of it either. <laughs> yeah, it's like <laughs> so. it's not bad. It's like okay. Yeah. It's like yeah. okay. You know, like I very few DS9 episodes are like bad. Right, um, right. This was just kind of okay. You know, it's not like a standout. So it was just really interesting for me to hear you guys talk about it. And a lot of why you guys even, you all even liked it was because you just came from it from a, such a different perspective. And mm-hmm. that was really interesting to me. And, you know, I really liked that just different point of view. And yeah. you know, that's and why. So I guess, should I, should I give the premise for why I enjoy this episode and see it as a, as, as at least a, a worthy, uh, a worthy addition to the trans canon of classic Star Trek in yeah, sure. the way that, that yeah. some episodes are, even if they don't explicitly state it. And so, um, if uh, folks who haven't seen it, the quick plot synopsis is, uh, O'Brien goes missing, He's they find out that he might be on the planet where Ezri's family runs their business. So she calls mom for help and mom's like, hey, I'd love to help you, but only if you come home because you've just gone through this big life change and you just need to be home. And then she basically blackmails Ezri into coming home. Like, I'm not going to help you find your friend unless you come home to me. Um, <clears throat> and so she comes home and this is um this is uh, the first time that she has seen her brothers since being joined. And I think the second time that she's seen her mom, because uh, if uh, I think they, they mentioned in the episode that mom visited once and she woke up and said, hi, mom, it's me, Curzon. Uh, <laughs> right. And yes, it is. There is so much I see in that episode that uh, that one tracks with my experience of kind of slowly becoming unknown to people that I had previously known and cared about and suddenly presenting yourself as a person who is remarkably different than the last time I saw someone else. And there, there are all, there's all kinds of awkwardness that can come with that interaction. And, you know, we see, uh, to, to sort of con- contrast that, you know, Adira comes out and three seconds later, it's fine. And everyone's calling them they, them. And it's never addressed again, right? Like, mm-hmm. I uh, imagine, like, he just got on Discovery's, like, email list and was like, it's they, them, or else. Just FYI. Thanks. <laughs> like, and that was the end of it, right? Um, and, of course, hopefully in the Star Trek future, that's how it all goes. Right. But, in, like, the 32nd century, it should <laughs> right, be very right, different. Right, the coming yeah. out experience would be very different. Um, but to see a reflection of the much more messy reality of like, no, I don't, I don't give a shit that you're different now. I really don't care about that. I just don't quite know how to handle you being different. Like, I don't know how to interact with you because you are different than you were the last time that I saw you. And you know, that this tracks with my experience in a couple of different ways, right? So obviously when I come out and transition, I, my physical appearance radically changes, which, uh, is a thing that takes some getting used to, right? Like if somebody is 
seeing even something as superficial as like one day you've got a big full beard. The next day you're clean shaven. One day you've got really long hair next. Like there's in anytime there's an outward, like radical physical adjustment, there's an adjustment to be made. And then when you are suddenly faced with the idea that you might need to interact with this person differently. So use a different name, use different pronouns, understand that um, their emotions might slightly work differently. The way that they react to certain social situ- situations might be different now. And so you're kind of playing this game of, getting to know someone a second time. Right. And that is something that so many trans people go through myself included. Um, you know, my mom is fantastic. I have literally nothing bad to say about my mom, aside from the fact that she's a flawed human being, just like the rest. She's made her mistakes. It's fine. She absolutely loves me. Never in a million years have I ever questioned that. Right. But there have been times where I'm just like, trying to make small talk about my life. And it is just so clear that she has no idea what I'm talking about. There's just zero cultural reference for what I'm talking about. Right. And that's not a criticism of her, right? Like to be very, very clear, that's not me saying there's something wrong with her that she messed up in some way or anything like that. It's just all of the sudden there is this way in which we cannot relate to each other and we have to figure out what that means. Right. Um, a really great example. Do you have an example of that to kind yeah, of give was, a little bit of context? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was not, you know, be, be as, uh, you know, however personal or not, not if, you know, you yeah. Know, well, and, and so this is comfortable for you. And this is kind of, tangentially related to queerness and transness, but it's not explicitly the either of these things. So lately I have been really, really embracing and acting on the fact that my wife and I are polyamorous, right? Uh, I married, I have a wife, she's wonderful. She's great. Uh, but we kind of are relationship anarchists outside of that, I guess, in that, she's my wife. I'm married to her. She's like my life partner. She's the one that like I mix finances with and that I expect to be with for a very, very long time. But outside of that, I date whoever I want. I have sex with whoever I want. And the only boundaries are be safe, get tested. Don't lie about it. Right. Um, and so I was talking to my mom on the phone one night about, I had gone to a concert with someone that I'm dating And, uh, and it was great because my wife and I don't share a lot of musical interests in common. So like, there's no reason that my, that my wife would want to come and see one of my favorite bands with me. She's not into crowds. She's not into loud music. She doesn't really like the music in the first place. And so if I took her to that, like, I would be grateful that she decided to came, but no doubt in my mind, she'd be miserable (laughs) if she went and uh, saw one of my favorite bands with me. And I don't want to pressure her into that. Right. Um, and so I went to a show with someone I was dating, someone who liked the band we were seeing, who likes going to concerts, likes getting hot and sweaty and dancing around or whatever. And so I was talking with my mom. I was like, this is such a great thing about polyamory, right? Like I can, you know, I I don't have to throw a relationship away because of minor differences in our interests. You know, if I want to go like dance and get sweaty and kiss somebody while I'm watching one of my favorite bands. I shouldn't have to divorce my wife <laughs> because she doesn't want to do that. Right. And I shouldn't have to suffer and just saying, well, that's a thing that I'll just never get in life. Right. Um, that's, what's great about being polyamorous. Like I went to a show with this girl, I danced and got sweaty and kissed her and talked about feelings. And, and I came home and told my wife all about it. And my wife's like, great. I'm glad you're home safe. Gr- glad you had a good time. And I went through all of this with my mom and her response was, Well, if you say so, (laughs) Um, just because the idea of arranging relationships outside of monogamy is just something that just does not really compute for her. Um, And not that she's like, well, that's shitty. You shouldn't do that. Whatever. She obviously supports me and she didn't come back with that. Like, well, that's terrible. You shouldn't be doing that. Um, It's just very clear that she doesn't get it. Um, And so there is... And that's, that's become kind of an an integral part of my life, right? That I have wonderful, loving relationships, uh, some purely sexual, which is fine, but like very deep, rewarding, emotional relationships, uh, sexual and romantic, uh, with more than one person. That's such a huge piece of who I am and how I express love and how I receive love. And it's something that's very, very important to me and something that I don't know that my mom will ever understand. (laughs) Um, or, you know, when to make it a more directly, uh, trans related thing, you know, my mom, uh, came with me to take care of me after I had bottom surgery. 
uh, my wife and I had bottom surgery very close to the same time. Uh, my wife's mom came and took care of us for a while. Then she flew home. My mom came and took care of us the rest of the time. And uh, again, 100% supportive. Like it went right back to playing like I'm mom, my kid's sick. I'm going to take care of my kid. I'm going to make sure my kid has dinner and water and like all of that stuff. Right. Um, but when I would try to talk to her about, you know, dysphoria and like, you know, why all of this is important and like what this is going to mean for my life, that is all so very, very abstract to her. She loves me. She supports me. It's wonderful. I have nothing bad to say about her, but that's just a way that we don't have available to connect with one another. And so to bring that back to prodigal daughter where, you know, Esri comes back and she is talking about how uncomfortable she is dealing with her family, how she can't keep pronouns straight. She wakes up and introduces herself as Curzon, you know, at the beginning of, of, of your journey of, of being trans very often, there are so many things that you're unsure of, right? Like maybe, maybe, you know, like, yes, I am trans for sure but I'm not a hundred percent sure. Am I non-binary? Am I uh, binary trans? Is there, do I want to do hormones? Do I want to do surgery? Do I want to change my clothing style? Do I want to change my name? What do I want to change my name to? There's just all mm -hmm. of these things that you're trying to figure out about yourself. And there's also a way in which it uh, opens up a lot of questions that you hadn't even thought about before. Right. Cause like I first came out as trans when like eight years ago, um, and I figured out I was non-binary like three years ago, uh, four years ago, something like that. And so there's, a, it kind of like opens up a lifetime of identity exploration that a lot of people go their entire lives without ever doing. And so there are certain kinds of people, even the most wonderful supporting people in the world, if you try to talk to them about stuff, that's just so far outside their life experience, they could, they, I mean, they could spend all the time and effort in the world and, and just not quite get it. Um, and I, I feel the need to keep saying this. I just want to make it very clear that that's not a knock on those people, right? Like that is not an insult at all. Um, it's just that on a certain level, if you don't have a specific life experience, you're not going to be able to understand that specific life experience. And when you figure out that you're queer, when you figure out that you're trans, there are a lot of things that can happen that sort of alienate you from the experiences of people that you knew before in ways that make it that can make it tough for you to interact with one another in ways that it may not have been previously. And so much of that episode is so much of that playing out. Um, because it, especially because I think, you know, when we go through this, like obviously her mom is overbearing, but I don't mm -hmm. think her mom's evil. Uh, obviously her brother kills someone, but I think her brother is a scared, traumatized kid too. Like, mm -hmm. I don't think he's right. a mono. I, I don't think he is actually an evil person. He's flawed like everyone else and made, and ultimately made a horrific decision. Um, and then, you know, big brother again, he's got a lot of pressure on him. He's making decisions. So also her family feels very real in that way that they're all obviously flawed people, but, not obviously bad people and right, they right. all very evidently love each other very much and want to connect with each other very much. And they're, uh, and, and specifically Esri, uh, getting joined puts up some barriers that weren't there before. And so just almost every family interaction that happens has that in context with it. And so for me, I see every one of those interactions through that lens, um, and I, I just, I, I can't help, but just see that entire episode through that lens, even, even though that's not, I mean, that that's kind of like the background for the story of the episode, right? It's not even necessarily the, the focus of, of the episode, but obviously because it's, you know, we fix it on the things and in, in episodes often that are most relevant to us. And that's the one <laughs> that's one of the ones that is, is really uh, meaningful to me in, in ways that I don't hear other people talk about super often i guess if that makes sense yeah totally. yeah that's, yeah go ahead Mike. um one of the things that came to mind for me is uh you mentioned that uh and and this this isn't this is sort of not on star trek this is more like real life just to help help uh our listeners and help us be better about connecting with people with different experiences do you have any suggestions for people who may know 
people who are are trans or are coming out in that process and how they can connect better, you know, rather than saying, well, that's nice or, you know, kind of some something yeah. where there's a little bit deeper connection or or, you know, acknowledgement of what is going through what the person that they're talking to is going through. Yeah, you know, it, it's hard and that's it, it's such a, an individual thing, right? Because there are some people I am going to have that conversation with that it's like I don't you have lots of questions about being trans and that's great and I want to educate you, but I would need like 4 hours to answer that question and I just don't have the bandwidth for that. I'm sorry. <laughs> um but Again, like, you know, if it's somebody like my mom, obviously I, I love my mom. She loves me. And so I want to put the effort into helping her understand. Right. Um, right. and so like, how, you know, how do you navigate a situation like that where you have someone who really, really wants to, and you actually have the desire to, to push that back on them and actually help them understand. And I think the, the, the first and most important thing is to just let go of the notion that if you don't share a particular experience that you can ever fully properly understand it. Um, you know, there are, there are ways in which I can empathize with people who are not white because I know what it's like to, to walk through society in a way where I am different from most people around. Right. That does not mean that experiencing transphobia is the same thing as experiencing racism. They are very, very different cultural phenomena, right? And mm -hmm. so I can say, you know, there are certain things where I can, I can maybe offer a little bit of extra compassion, a little bit of extra empathy, because there's this way that your experience maybe parallels mine a little bit. Um, but sort of honoring the uniqueness of that experience and acknowledging like, I, there's probably not I'm never, never going to understand it a hundred percent and letting go of the notion that that is like a necessary thing, because I think that oftentimes is where that comes from is the idea that I can't fully accept a, a thing until I fully understand the thing. And I think letting go of that is probably the biggest thing to, to get from, from point A to point a point seven five or <laughs> whatever you want to, mm -hmm. <laughs> that was a horrible mixed, uh, uh metaphor there, but I'm, I'm sure you know what I mean. Um, and, and that also there are, you don't necessarily have to bridge that gap to have a meaningful relationship with people. I don't think, um, because <laughs> I don't just, listen, I have so many cis friends. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't want to be that mm. person. Um, but like, that's to say, like, I, I legitimately, I have lots of people in my life who are not trans that I have very deep, meaningful, connected relationships with. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they may not necessarily understand what it means to be trans doesn't necessarily mean that's not possible. Right. Right. Um, maybe it can mean there's a little bit of extra work involved, uh, but it does. It, it's not impossible. And I think that is so much the roadblock that we that we have trouble getting past this idea that in order for me to truly support you i have to understand everything about you and that's not true um and for me to you know say for example like if you can't ex if you can't properly explain to me why that thing was racist I'm not going to be in solidarity with you in an anti-racist action unless you properly convince me that thing wasn't real. like that's horrible allyship if you're a white person. Right. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, I don't you know, I, I think it's important for us to just get that there are differences there. Are, there are bridges that we may not necessarily uh, be able to to get over. But that doesn't mean that you can't have a good, honest deep, meaningful relationship with someone. And I feel like a lot of people think that you have to have that. That's like a prerequisite. And I don't think that's right. true. And I think that actually can get us a lot of the way towards bridging that divide. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that yeah. totally makes sense. And I really like what you're saying, what you said about your relationship with your mom and how you were able to really try to, you know, do your best to articulate your, your circumstances and your mindset and your paradigm to her, but also be able to kind of give her the space to empathize, but not totally understand. Because I think that when I was, you know, I, I have someone to have a lot of non 
I have a lot of cisgender straight friends. Like a lot, I think actually most of my friends are straight. I have plenty of gay friends, plenty of friends in the queer community, but I have a lot of friends that are straight. And I think that when I was first coming out, um, for me, a mental block when it, when when I was just coming out to myself and coming out to them was my, and this is when I was, you know, first coming out. So it was, I was still trying to grapple with a lot of things and there was a lot of internal turmoil that was going on is that I, there would be a sense of like bitterness and anger that they did not understand what I was going through. And that changed over time, you know, and I was able to give them, and I think, you know, we in the queer community have through our own experiences and through our own need for empathy have also been able to give others a grace to not understand us and to be like, that's okay. If they don't totally understand like exactly what we're saying, it's okay that other people that are different from us don't understand us, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we can't form, form these deep relationships with them, that we can't have these meaningful conversations they, as long as they are giving us a space to be able to articulate who we are, that's fine. You know, we have, we come from very different backgrounds and like, I can't, ex- like similar how I do not relate to my straight friends with their straight marriages, with their kid, their, their three kids. I don't want <laughs> yeah. kids. You know, I can't relate to that yeah. life. Yep. You know, they, you know, and similarly, I can't expect them to relate to me in that exact same way. And yeah. I think that it just took me some time to kind of get to that point. Yeah. And and I think, you know, another big thing to think about is how that anger and bitterness gets directed, because I certainly share it. Right. But I also think that, you know, the same, I guess, cultural forgetting that colonialism in the United States has foisted on us about like, you know, it's a lot more complicated than this to be fair, but the dominant culture that we live in kind of invented the gender binary, right? Like if you look at human civilizations that existed before colonialism, before, you know, that specific brand of European Christianity colonized the world, right? Basically every human civilization that exists had like acknowledged and honored the idea that what we recognize as gender is, is a, is a broadly diverse category of person. And it is this one specific cultural hegemony that, that, that pushed that idea on us. Um, but you know, that idea that robbed me of that understanding for myself for so long, that's actually what is robbing my cis friends of the ability to understand me. Right? Like if it is so difficult for a cis person to understand the trans experience, I I put a lot of the blame for that on the dominant culture that we live in as opposed to each individual cis person, right? Because like I grew up in the same mm-hmm. fucked up gender soup that everyone else did. And to be entirely fair, the main reason that I understand any of it is because I happen to be trans. <laughs> you know, if I had been born as a cis white dude, I don't know that I've I don't know that I would have gotten there. Maybe I like I hope I would have. Uh but I like to be entirely fair, like, I don't know that I did for sure. I, or I don't know that I would for sure. And so I think there is, um, you know, I, I have such a complicated relationship with the obligation to, uh, to automatically provide benefit of the doubt, right? Like if somebody says something really ignorant about trans people, um, or, or anything, honestly, um, it, especially about things that don't super affect me, right? Like as a white person, I feel far more obligated to engage on topics of racism than I do on topics of transphobia because transphobia is so personal to me that I'm just like, I don't, maybe I'm just going to run away from this one. Right. But like, if somebody says something silly, there's at least a part of me that has to consider for like a hot second, like, is this person engaging in good faith and, they're just ignorant. Like they, they actually do have all of the best intentions in the world and they just don't have the knowledge, the experience, the context to understand what's happening versus like, is this person being actively hateful? And I think, I don't know. I think that distinction matters a lot less than a lot of people would have us believe, because I think a lot of people think intention is everything and impact. It doesn't matter. And I am certainly not one of those people. 
Um, but you know, when somebody says something just like hellaciously ignorant about trans people, there's a part of me that's like, are they saying that because they just don't know? Are they saying that because they're an asshole? Because the, the, those are different things, uh, but they're equally hurtful either way. And so like, how do you navigate, you know, I want to hold this person accountable, but also if I'm like, Hey, you asshole, what the fuck is wrong with you at that point? Then I don't have any chance to change that person's mind. Uh, but is changing that person's mind my goal? Maybe my goal is for them to stop hurting the trans people around them. And so I can just make them feel really uncomfortable saying whatever bullshit it is they're saying. And then we can come back around later and address the like, hey, so can we have a conversation about what actually happened there? Uh, I mean, that's a, cal- a calculation that I'm making constantly. Um, but all that's to say, like, I mean, for the most part, every single one of us grew up in this like really fucked up soup of really, really bad ideas about gender. And I can't blame like i can't necessarily blame cis folks for like getting that on them swimming in the pool of gender that we all grew up in right like (laughs) yeah i mean it really boils down to how much the do people want to do the work to to begin to understand or to take into account uh someone else's experience so it's it's really and and that that is a crapshoot these days you really don't know you know, you don't know mm-hmm. what, if it's, you know, for racism, transphobia, for anything related to women's rights, um, any, you know, it's really hard to know these days whether people are are operating in, in good faith. So I don't, you know, I, I, I can't imagine in your experience how, how often you really think, do I give this person the benefit of the doubt or not? Given oh my God, the, the it's world. almost fucking daily. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To be honest. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I, I think <sighs> Oof, this is so hard. It's, it's an extraordinarily complicated calculation that we do. Um, because obviously, I mean, the fact that I am sitting here as a non-binary person, like it, it would be hard for me to argue that there's a right answer. There's a wrong answer. There's good and bad. And that's all that exists. Like, that's just not how the world works. Um, but the world also, is not ones and zeros, essentially. It, right, you know, exactly, exactly. And yeah. and what becomes difficult about that is, uh, so all of that being true, what is your personal responsibility, right? That is a hard question to answer um, because, you know, what is my mental health as a single person in comparison to the well-being of all trans people? Why the fuck do I even matter, right? Uh but like I matter. I think each of you two individually matters. I think all of my individual trans friends, ma- like I think all of your well being matters, all of my trans friends well being matters. And for me to say that, like, you have to go in and individually do all of this work of teasing out, you know, whether this person's point of view comes from earnest ignorance, well meaning ignorance, and we just need to work really hard to get them out of that. You know, I, I I do think that that calculation can be worth it, right? Because I've chosen to take a chance on people before and and blessedly turned out to be wrong. Like, like, wow, like you really put in the work and you got it, and I was not sure that that was gonna happen. Um, but that is so rare that statistically, if I erred on the chance of giving no one the benefit of the doubt, there would be very few misses. <laughs> You know what I mean? And that also means that I end up in a much better place in terms of my own mental health where I'm not constantly trying to justify my humanity to everyone I talk to. And, uh, you know, so I, I tend to fall on the idea of like, if you feel up for that, it is work that is well worth doing, but it is work that no individual person is morally obligated to engage in. Um, and that's, you know, messy and imperfect, but I think that's kind of the best way that I can think to, to give any sort of, <laughs> any sort of prescription for how we might engage in those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, well, that's, that's been really helpful and, uh, powerful to hear. How about we, we, we veer back into a little bit more Star Trek and talk a little bit about oh, you your talk queerness. About Star Trek on your Star Trek podcast. Come on. <laughs> um, 
I know it's you know it's it's hard some days to to you know there's so little Star Trek to talk about these days. So I know, it's, it's right? Really where it's really where is hard it? To, where is it? <laughs> so little, um, so little. <laughs> so um, I'm trying to think. I, I had a question, and then, uh, but let me see about Prodigal Daughter or something else. Well, I, uh, I, I well, think you, actually, you seem to be leading into like my story of Star Trek fandom. And how that even became a thing. That is actually yes. I, I wanted to. I did. I wanted to delve into like your your queerness and how how Star Trek played into that and and wh- where where that journey began and and where it's taken you. So yes, actually, I'd thank you. That is yeah, perfect. absolutely. Um, so of course, memories from childhood are usually fuzzy, but I will tell you the way that I remember it, uh, with the caveat being that I was like ten. So this could all be wrong. <laughs> The way I remember it is that I was introduced to Star Trek during a Star Trek marathon late night hosted by Jonathan Frakes, where they played a few episodes from the first few seasons of Next Gen, played part one of Best of Both Worlds and premiered part two of Best of Both Worlds. So I missed that god awful summer where everyone was screaming and very, very angry about the cliffhanger. Yes, you did. You missed all. Yeah, that was me and Mike. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I I know that was a hard time for many, uh, and and I I my sincerest (laughs) thoughts and prayers and apologies. Thoughts and prayers. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, thoughts and prayers. uh, But so you know, as as a kid, it very much started out for me as a like, ooh, there are aliens and spaceships and technology, and I'm a nerd, and this is all very neat and interesting to me, and then. You know, over the next year or two, when I started watching more and more, I started to get the idea, you know, whatever idea I could get as a 10, 11, 12 year old kid, like, oh, they're, they're actually trying to say something bigger than, oh, this ship met this planet of aliens and some things happened. Like they're trying to actually say more than that here. And I, uh, eventually saw the outcast which is, you know, if you talk about trans stuff in Star Trek, that's kind of the conversation that always happens. And there are lots of trans folks who are Star Trek fans that rightly have very, very complicated feelings about that episode. And I don't begrudge them any of those complicated feelings. But I will say for me watching it, it was very much an experience of, okay, I see that that person is different. And I think that maybe that person is different in a way that feels familiar to me. So like I see something in this person that feels familiar to my own life experience and that's neat. And, you know, then I see, oh, but like nobody on this person's planet is okay with how this person is different, but all my friends on the enterprise are all ready to to defend this person. They, they not only think that it's okay for this person to be different, but they think it's cool as shit that this difference, this person is different. And they want to understand this person and they want to like dig into like, you know, what is life about for this person? What can we learn from them? Right. And so that was all super, super appealing to me as a kid. And so I was just immediately hooked from both sides of the equation from the, just like really cool, interesting sci-fi stuff to the, like these stories are saying far bigger things about life side of things. And so I watched um, DS9 from right around the time that it premiered all the way up through the finale. I I remember watching the premiere of Voyager when it first premiered. And then um, for a while, our local UPN affiliate dropped their UPN affiliation and I couldn't watch the end of Voyager. So I didn't actually see the end of Voyager. Oh, that's so sad. I know, right? I didn't didn't see it until until Voyager was added to Netflix. I did a whole rewatch and finally got around to it. Uh, Oh, wow. Okay. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, And so, you know, it's just been kind of a lifelong love uh, from the side of just I'm a nerd and technology and the future and aliens. And that's all cool to like, you know, the stories that this thing is telling and how we interact with those stories can have so much uh, more profound implications for our humanity, for the way that we interact with each other, for the way that we think about our impact on the world and the universe around us and all of that. Like it's been cool to me from both sides of the equation. Um, And I also just, I mean, Klingons are rad and I speak a little Klingon and it's cool. And I, I, I will, I will scream until the day that I die to 
really, really get to know some Klingons that exist from outside the military and government hierarchy. But that's a different podcast episode. I just felt it felt the need to. Say. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> um, well, speaking of, so you watched DS Nine all the way through from the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, did Jadzia and uh, you know, uh, fortunately, unfortunately, Esri. Um, I, I was a huge Jadzia fan, so. Did, did you identify with them right away or uh, was that something that grew or did it happen after Jadzia died and we got Ezri? Definitely did not catch on to it right away. I will say it's, you know, maybe within the last five or 10 years that I've really, really started to get all of the gender implications of that. Um, Cause you know, I was, I was thinking far more in terms of, the the nerdy sci-fi aspect of it than the more general broad philosophy of it um so no no as a kid i I didn't really see that in esri or jadzia i very much do now uh but as a kid i i I did not really i mean aside from um rejoined of course because it's a little more explicit (laughs) in rejoined yeah that was much more explicit yeah (laughs) Yeah. uh but you know i i like to say you know (laughs) If, if I'm ever asked to give like the best, most accurate description of my gender identity, I can actually only answer that question in a room full of other Star Trek fans because the best way that I can possibly describe my gender identity is newly joined Trill. And it's specifically because of Esri and just how like, what the fuck even am I anymore after this thing has happened to me? I don't understand anything about myself or the world. <laughs> Uh, so essentially an unjo- uh, untrained Trill who did not go through any preparation for the joining at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I mean, separately from that, you know, I can say, you know, who do I want to be from Star Trek? Jadzia, for sure. Who actually am I in Star Trek? Esri, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Esri, early season seven. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Just like yeah, yeah. unsure, like... I'm even like I'm self-aware enough to know that like I'm a pretty smart, I'm insightful person, you know, and I think Esri probably knew that about herself on a level as well. But she's had all this stuff going on that threw her confidence and all of that completely into chaos. And so yeah, it just it it fits so much. <laughs> so what um so jumping ahead to modern trek, as I guess we'll call it, uh where the platinum where and what do you s- <laughs> yeah uh where and what kind of appeals to you and what where do you see um see the the growth uh the change the changes in in how star trek approaches gender and identity and the lgbtqia community uh where do you kind of where, where does it begin for you and and how does that um yeah. how does that come up you know, it, it it's interesting. I love that newer Star Trek is just so fucking queer. Like, my God, it's so queer. Like, I, God, I love how queer it is. Um, but, you know, the thing that I wonder, and I bet there have been some amazing conversations in the writer's room about this. I would just love to be a spider under that table. Um, you know, I, as, as a show that exists in a time where we would hope that nobody gives a shit about you being queer, how do you have those conversations? Because we have to keep in mind that we're making shows from modern audience where the existence of queer people is still very much controversial. Um, but we are making this show about a time where ostensibly no one should care. So it's an important conversation to be having is those people simply existing in that universe enough of a commentary. I don't actually know the answer to that question because I I think there is value in simply having a character that is queer that you see as queer and you don't have to unpack or explain it too much. Um, But I would also love to see Star Trek answering questions about queerness and gender that are maybe 10, 15 years ahead of where we are now, you know, discourse that's happening in the queer community specifically about like acceptance of asexual folks, for example, like 
Shout out to my ace friends. I will punch somebody in the mouth over, uh, over being, uh, ex- ex- exclusionary toward my ace friends. Um, but you know, I, I feel like outside of the queer community, that discourse is basically unknown. So like, how cool would it be for star Trek to be at the front of that conversation and understanding that, like, if you're asexual, that's a thing that's actually okay to be. That's a thing that people are. That is a, a mm-hmm. normal part of the spectrum of, of human sexuality is being asexual. Um, you know, it, it, it can be, I, I empathize with the problems a writer's room would have in navigating mm-hmm. that. Um, yeah, I, I told this to Mike before, and we had a conversation with a few other folks, um, about this, but I feel that there was a lost opportunity when Adira came out to Stamets because Stamets is a citizen of the 23rd century mm-hmm. and Adira is a citizen of the 31st, 31st, 32nd century. I'm forgetting 31st, I think 31st, basically, yeah. you know, very far ahead. And Way the even, fuck into the future. <laughs> it's like, I'm a 31st, it's like so far ahead, yeah, I'm like, whatever. Yeah. But even the disparity between Stamets' experience and Adir's experience should be so different that I thought it would have been really interesting for Adira's quote unquote coming out scene to be so, like, so, like, parallel to maybe how it would be in our day and age in the sense that. For Stamets, it's a big deal, but then for Deer, it's not a big deal because it's, you know, they're so far ahead of where they are, you know, if that makes sense. It um, does. But it, but, but it was a very, it was a very 21st century conversation. Yeah. And so, I feel there was something let, lost there. Let me, let, let me, let me flip that against you and just see how you, see how you feel about it. Sure. So if you think about the galaxy in the time that discovery came from, they had just finished the Mm -hmm. Klingon war. Mm -hmm. Other than that, no hugely horrific impending disasters happening. Right. So like they're heading into the time of TOS where there are certainly individual conflicts to be had, but nothing that is making the entire galaxy as a whole feel like, Holy shit, we are in trouble. And so I would say as utopian a scenario as the galaxy gets is, is what we are heading into like post season two of discovery, the time where uh, discovery is coming from. And in times of peace and prosperity, generally speaking, societies tend to progress a little bit socially because we're not constantly trying to figure out like, Oh, who is the other that we can blame for whatever horrible circumstance we're having. And of course, in times of mass disaster, societies often will tend to regress. And so this was my argument for why, like why should Adira even be afraid to come out in the way that they were. And for me, I find it very believable that earth society could have regressed to the point where it might actually be a thing for them to come out. Right. And so for me, it's personally very believable given that context that like in the time that Adira came from given, you know, post the burn, everything is very like every person for themselves. We're just coming out of this horrible, Mm -hmm. like galaxy threatening disaster that society would regress a bit. And so it's not entirely unbelievable for me to believe that Stamets is actually coming from a time where socially things are a little bit more progressive than where Adira came from. Uh, of course, that's, that's, a, that's an amazing too. insight. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's, no, I that's, think that's great. Yeah, yeah, I think that's interesting. Because, but at the same time, I would argue that what we've learned from Star Trek is that basically every century there's an issue. It's either the Borg are threatening <laughs> all of existence, yeah. or the Demi Moore is threatening all of existence, <laughs> right? Or yeah, there's okay, something. <laughs> um, yeah. And or you're talking about Star Trek Four, where the whale probe is going to destroy Earth, or it's <laughs> or there's there's always yeah. some issue at least once yeah. a decade. Yeah, so super fair. <laughs> you know, I would argue that based upon our knowledge of Star Trek, there's always some problem. Yeah, and existence as we know it is about to end at any point, especially <laughs> in. The Discovery era, where literally yeah. every year there is a <laughs> existence-threatening thing on the horizon. You know, don't get me started. So, you know, that would be my argument. I totally get what you're saying. But I just gotta you know, say, 
people are listening and not watching <laughs> the tone of voice and the look on my face. I'm just face. saying. I feel like I have the issues with discovery, so you know, whatever. <laughs> Um, but you know, every yeah, it's basically every year, like existence is on the edge of doom. Uh, so, you know, it's but, it's something. There's always something. So I, I will yeah. say I love I mean I, I will say I love how casually queerness exists in in most of new Star Trek. Sure. Um I will say that I about had a fucking heart attack when Culver died uh in season one. I the first time ever I was watching a TV show and I literally had to pause the show so I could catch my breath and calm down for a second so I could finish the episode. First time that's ever happened was in that episode when that happens. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm not a super huge fan of basically all of Colburn and Stamets relationship for a long time being entirely focused on the trauma that they experienced uh, I get it. It wouldn't be a show if characters weren't working through conflict. Um, but it still feels very like bury your gaze trope adjacent. Um, mm-hmm. I would love if like the first important fact we learned about Jet Reno wasn't that her wife died. <laughs> you know, like like uh, I, I would love it if uh, we met Gray at a point other than the time where he dies. <laughs> You know, like they're and again, like th- this is a show where the stakes are high and everyone is in the midst of disaster. So if a character conspicuously didn't have trauma, that would be weird. I get it. Um, but it, it feels, you know, like we're we're giving very specific extra trauma to our queer characters in Discovery. And I don't super love that uh, as much as I love the toothbrush scene, the legendary toothbrush scene. It was fantastic. Uh, and as that much is as my I favorite love, scene. So, so that, like yeah. that, just uh, life. Cha- life really felt different after that. After seeing that in Star Trek, for me personally, and, yeah. And, and and in later seasons, the way that uh, Culber and Stamets communicate with each other, and they talk with each other, and they're like vulnerable and honest with their feelings. Sometimes they fight a little bit. Sometimes they're a little playful. Like that all feels very real to me. Like that is like, yes. I know, se- I know several, several queer men that are that couple. Right. And that's wonderful. I love that. Um, I love Adira. I love gray. I hate the fact that I feel like gray is probably not going to be back next season. I don't know that for sure, but I just feel like that was set up for the fact that like, he's probably not coming back. But I also um, feel that they don't know what to, they don't know what to do with gray if he if he's not an accessory to Adira, this is this is my they they didn't really yeah, give him yeah. enough. Yeah, and I, yeah, you know, he's I like, agree with that. Going back to trail, I'm gonna be. I don't remember like uh, a guardian, whatever they call it. guardian. Thank guardian. you. Yeah, yeah. See you later. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. I don't really feel they um, knew what to do with him. So I will say sad. the 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 bit of the bit of queerness that I just have nothing but praise for is goddamn Beckett Mariner. She is the disaster by <laughs> yes. that we all oh, love her. Beckett Mariner. I uh, love her yes. so fucking much. And the fact that Lower Decks is now doing the enemies to lovers trope thing with her and Jennifer, I just cannot yes. get enough like injected into my veins. It is so fucking good. So yeah. I'm a big fan of that. I also love that very casually we learned that Nurse Chapel is queer. Yes. Uh, Big fan of that. Um, yeah, loving so, Strange New Worlds since you know we we opened up that can of worms. It's just the the way that they approach queerness is very just matter of fact. Um, we talked about Serene, the Serene Squall before we start recording, but they don't even make a big deal that Captain Angel is non-binary. Like it's just part of the conversation. They don't make a big deal of it. It is what it is. It's just a fact of life. And I really like that. And they're smart. They're cunning. They're recurring, which they're definitely going to be recurring. Hopefully, they're hot and as fuck. Like, let's just go ahead. So and confident. Say it out loud. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, I, I, I thought that they did such a great job with that character. And what you're saying about Norse Chapel, just like these small things where it's just part of life, and it doesn't need to be a big deal, and it's just part of who they are. And people recognize that and respect it. It's great. I love it. I uh, And here's the thing. I am sympathetic to people who are a little tired of 
bisexual folks being the villains, pansexual folks being the villains. Like, you know, you the, sure. there's the the very quick reference to Mirror Universe Stamets as pansexual because we all know the duplicit the duplicitous types are the non-binary folks and the bi and pan folks because they can't just fucking pick one, right? Like that that's a very very uh long-standing trope especially in Star Trek. And so I am sympathetic to the people that are like, "Ugh, we get another non-binary character and they're a villain. Come on. But also like that specific villain. Come on. Like, how can you not see that? They're just one of the greatest, <laughs> like just so. Great. I mean, this is uh, this is strange. New world's uh, Harry mud version of Harry mud. And what a great, uh, you know, Jesse did such an amazing job. She owned every scene that she was in. And yeah, uh, it was, it was am- amazing in so many ways. Like the, uh, a, a thing that I in particular appreciate about, for example, uh, Sonequa Martin green, the way that she does Burnham, there is a subtlety to her performance that I'm just like, wow, you know what? Like I'd probably like it and be fine with it if someone else was doing it. But the specific way that she is acting this part just adds an extra thing to it. And I feel like Angel was very much the same way. There was a subtlety to the way that they acted that it was just like, wow, there's like, there are layers here. It's a very, very interesting and nuanced performance that it's like, I'm actually fine with having another non-binary villain because it's this specific one. Like, they're just that good. I'm just going to roll with it. Yeah, (laughs) I would agree. What do you what do you think about the conversations that uh, Angel and Spock had, and how that reflects um, otherness and identity in in Star Trek, and and just for for those of us watching and and trying to who might be struggling with, you know, I'm I'm not this or that, uh, you know, or you know, if I if I am not this or that, what am I? Uh, it's hard. Like I, I don't. Like I, I wish I had something super profound and meaningful to say about it. Aside from the fact that, like, when they were saying that, I was like, "Wow, yeah." Like it's, mm. you know, th- there's something. I, I don't want to say comforting because it's like, well, hopefully in 300 years, the people won't have to have those conversations anymore. But I guess 300 years from now, even if we're not having that conversation about gender, we'll be having that conversation about some other aspect something of else. who we are, yeah. right? And so I feel like that's kind of a universal thing, you know, Um, I think the profound thing about what Captain Angel or at the time, what was her alter ego's name? Sorry. Oh, gosh. Oh, shit. Whatever. Now that that we called them Angel, it's uh, it's hard to go back to what they were. But what was great about that Dr. scene... Dr. Aspen, Dr. Aspen. Thank you, Dr. Aspen. Aspen. Yes. Is that the conversation with Spock in in Spock's quarters was when Spock was like, well, if I'm neither Vulcan or human, then what am I? Yeah. And Dr. Aspen was like, I can't answer that question for you. You need to answer that question. And I think that ultimately that is the answer that you need to go through that discovery and figure it out for yourself because no one else can answer like where you fit and who you are. You need to figure that out. And I think that's the journey for all of us. Right. Like I, I, I'm, I'm comfortable with being with people saying that I'm gay. I'm, I'm comfortable with saying that I'm gay, but my idea of being gay, quote unquote, being gay, may be very different from what Mike's idea of being gay is. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what's beautiful about this community is that, you know, even though we we celebrate these labels or celebrate our, our diversity, we all are on a unique journey and no one can tell us what that journey is. Yeah. And, you know, that's. There's a push and pull that I talk about a lot, especially with folks who are just figuring themselves out in terms of queerness and transness. And, um, you know, I I always say that, like, you know, when when you're trying to figure yourself out, understanding that the way that we think about gender is some things, it's a thing that some people decided on and they made a call. Like, if you fit within this box, we're going to call you a man. If we, if you fit in this box, we're going to call you a woman. Um, because by our observation, most people who have these characteristics are X and most people who have these characteristics are Y so on and so forth. Right. Um, 
I think there are areas in life where we take it for granted that there is a very wide spectrum of experience, right? Like I think if you talk to 10 random people on the street and you say, if I asked you about gender and the job of being a car mechanic, what do you think? I think the average person would tell you that like, you know, there are probably more men who are car mechanics, but you could be a woman and be a car mechanic, right? Like it might be harder for you because of misogyny. Uh, but like, there's nothing about being a car mechanic that should call into question your womanhood, right? The idea that m- being a car mechanic is a man thing. Like that's just a thing that some people decided. <laughs> and I think there are a lot of more esoteric identity questions that we need to have that same attitude for. Right. Uh, like most people who are born with penises grow up pretty comfortable with being called men. And that's cool. There's nothing wrong with that, but that doesn't make it inherently the truth. And that when we pick apart what we are handed in terms of what makes a man, what makes a woman, what makes a non-binary person, what makes a trans person, what makes a queer person, uh, there is, there are zero people who will tick every single box simultaneously of what we associate with those things. And I think those of us who are other in one way or another, it is harder for us to come down on where we are because we don't have that external validation of whatever box, whatever label we think fits us best and decide to declare. It is so much harder to find external validation for those things. And I think a lot of people take that for granted because so many people who get external validation for everything, their entire lives think they don't need it. And that's only because they've never experienced not having it, (laughs) you know? Um, and so to, to bring that back to the, you know, to the top of, of conversation is I think that's a very acute and discreet way of experiencing it, right? Like I am halfway between, between two very discreet worlds. Like that's a very easy way to express that conflict. But I think that is a conflict that is near universal to the human experience. Uh, it's just that most of us experience it in a much more subtle and messy and complicated way. Uh, and those of us who are, I don't know, gender weirdos, I'm a gender weirdo. I don't know. That's probably a problematic term. Uh, but those of us who just kind of don't fit, uh, we have like so much extra work to do to figure out where we fit. And I think for me, the fundamental conversation is like, I don't even think that a person need figure out where they fit. I think if you're trying to navigate the world and have a life and have a career and all of that, you kind of have to figure out where society is going to categorize you and at least like be aware of that and be ready to play the part when you need to do it for survival sake or whatever. Um, so like, you know, if I think it's going to make the difference between a paycheck or not, if somebody is treating me like a woman, quote unquote, I might not fight too hard against that because it's what I have to do to survive. That doesn't necessarily diminish anything about who I actually am as a person. And I think that is a dissonance that the average person may not have to navigate in such an acute way. Um, And I think even just being aware of that difference and being aware of the difference between like, I am choosing to allow society to put me into a certain box for survival sake versus like, which box do I actually fit in? I feel like often we treat those as if they are the same question when they're in fact, very, very different questions. Yeah. I think for me personally, um, as you're kind of talking through some of that, I I was thinking about my own struggles with, with the word queer. And Mm -hmm. uh, because growing up before I knew that I was gay or, you know, or the fact that I was gay and didn't know how to explain that or reconcile that with my family, my spirituality, all the things that you are, that are put upon you as you grow up. Um, That word was thrown around as a, you know, a swear word Mm -hmm. and um, a very negative, uh, negative word in, in the, in the universe that I grew up in small uh, town in Maine. So, um, 
I still struggle to this day when people use the word queer. Uh, not not that I struggle for in the sense that uh, I don't like it. I, I don't like it applied to me necessarily yet. I'm becoming more and more comfortable with it. But for me, it just harkens back to some trauma, some trauma that I faced as a mm-hmm. as a kid growing up. And uh, even though that I didn't I didn't know that I was or I didn't know internally that I was gay people made assumptions that I was gay based upon my, what I was wearing or um, how I'm more sensitive than a typical man or guy or boy mm-hmm. would be. And therefore I'm queer and that's a bad thing. And so right. all the, you know, so I still struggle with that word. And, and I think recently I, I watched something um it was probably an Instagram reel or something where, or, or something along that lines where they talked about reclaiming the word queer mm-hmm. for themselves and for the community. Um, and, and so I'm still in the process of doing that myself, but uh, I, you know, I, I definitely feel more comfortable saying that I'm a member of the queer community um, and, and, you know, that I don't necessarily, I also was thinking about, um, you know, gender identity in the sense of gender roles, uh, especially in relationships. So I mm-hmm. think there's still a struggle with um, same sex couples and, uh, you know, are I'm going to I'm going to be generous and say our straight and cis allies who still don't understand, like, OK, who's the man and who's the woman in the relationship? And, <laughs> and you know, that very, you know, that very I mean, that that. <laughs> that harkens back to, to, you know, younger days, but I still feel like it, it's out there. I still think that, Oh, 100% you know, it's out there. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely, you know, but I, I don't think, you know, personally in my life, I don't think about that. You know, my, my partner, Dennis and I do things that would be considered either role and we don't really assign roles like that. And we share the responsibilities of, of a life that, um, is not, um, is not, uh, binary in the sense of, you know, it's either this or that it's, you know, it's, it's coming up with our own identity in, in our relationship. And I think that's why one of the reasons why reclaiming words like queer can be very politically useful, right? Because there is a difference between assimilation and liberation, right? Assimilation is, gay people fit into all of the same boxes and systems and institutions that straight people were previously subject to. And liberation means that we exist however the fuck we want and that's it. And that's all there is to it. Right. And for me, one of the politically useful things about using the word queer is to specifically distinguish myself politically in that way. And that like, I'm not actually interested in the white picket fence, two and a half kids, uh, you know, diversified investment portfolio. Like I'm not interested in fiddling and I'm not interested in in fitting into the capitalist norms that we have provided just like, Oh yeah, it's still okay to do that as a queer person uh, or as a, as, as a trans person. Right. Like I don't, I'm not interested in being treated the way that our society treats women. And I'm not interested in being treated the way that our society treats men. I think there are significant problems with both. Right. Um, And I I think for me, what is politically useful specifically about the word queer as it is a way for me to one, describe myself in the way like I'm certainly not cis and I'm certainly not straight. Uh, But I think it also is a politically useful way to separate the fact that like, no, I'm not just, you know, a, a, a queer person who wants to live in the same system as everyone else, right? Like I am a queer person who thinks that queerness has something important to say for how humanity should relate to each other in general. Right. Um, like romantic and sexual relationships can actually be whatever the fuck feels good to us. It doesn't actually have to be prescribed by anything, right. It can be monogamous, it can be polyamorous. It can be, um, you know, a, a couple, a throuple, four or five, six people, whatever, like, we can actually re- arrange our romantic and sexual relationships however the hell we want, gender-wise, number-wise, role-wise, all of that sort of stuff. And, you know, for me, that's what it's – that's one of the things that's specifically useful about that. Uh, but, you know, I also say that as a person who comes from a younger generation, right? Like, I mean, I, I certainly had that word 
thrown at me uh, whenever, you know, if I would cry because I was like extra sensitive or whatever. But at the time, I didn't see myself as gay or anything like that. And so I didn't like I, I don't have that association that a lot of people do. Um, but I respect people that do. Right. Like because uh, it, very especially it's a generational thing. You know, if I meet somebody who's like like, no, I had some people beat the shit out of me while calling me queer. You don't ever call me queer. I have nothing but respect for that. Right. Like I would never argue with that person. Um, but that's why it makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, I guess one, one final question sort of related to queerness and, and Star Trek. Um, is there something that you would love to see? Um, I, I know you mentioned, uh, asexual, um, as being something, you know, in the future that you'd hope that they would see, is there anything else that you'd love to see the writers kind of tackle and Star Trek and, and, beyond i want to see bisexual men or pansexual men who aren't alternate universe bad guys <laughs> um because Fair. that's like you know if you think about the various queer demographics right like there are definitely a few boxes that we have not touched yet uh but and like there are a shit ton of bisexual men actually in the world and we have not seen any in star trek that we know of as of yet <laughs> um, yeah you know, again, aside from Mirror Universe Stamets, who is pansexual, uh, who is a bad guy, right. which is another extension of the like the bad guy, bisexual, pansexual, trope. or your trope. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Just seeing someone that we know is a bi man existing in Star Trek, that would be delightful. Um, you know, I, I, I think this is headcanon, to be clear, uh, but my headcanon is that both Tendi and Rutherford are ace. Um, oh, interesting, had many yeah. conversations with ace friends and, uh, and, and I, I, I think they, I think they agree with me, but I'm not a member of that community, so I don't want to claim anyone on their behalf, but that's my head cannon. Right. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, great. Well, thank you so much for coming on our little, yes, thanks Callie. This is and, great. Yes, uh, of course. So to close the interview out, do you want me to teach you how to say gay and cling on? Absolutely. That's sure. great. Yeah, why not? Okay. So this isn't a canon word. It's a fanon word. This is a thing that uh, someone came up with. Um, so you can't find this in the Klingon dictionary, but it is a thing that okay. is generally used in the Klingon speaking community and is generally understood to mean uh, a, a reference to the queer umbrella, people who aren't straight. So three syllables. Har a nan. Har. 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 I can't roll a? my tongue. A. Yeah. Har a. Non. Non. Har a non. Non. So it's it's ng, but at the beginning of a word, which we don't often do in English. So it can oh, be. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Har a non. And the, the literal translation is denizen of the rainbow. Oh. There we go. That's cool. Har so, a non. No. Har a And I can't roll my tongue like that I either. I can't roll my tongue. But so. uh, I can. So if we want to, if we want to be I real badass, it. you say har engan mach tach judge. Remain queer. <laughs> oh, <okay>. All right. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thank you so awesome, much Callie. for being with us tonight. We really appreciate your time. Callie, where can our listeners find you? Yes, you can find me at Callie gets it on Twitter, where I can often be found bullying transphobes, yelling about gender, sometimes tweeting in uh, Klingon and generally yelling about Star Trek and gender and audio stuff. I also make a podcast called Queer Splaining, and you should be able to find that wherever you listen to podcasts. Oh, and you should also check out the Lambda Quadrant, the Lambda Quadrant.org. They would murder me if they found out that that was an afterthought. It's not an afterthought. The Lambda Quadrant folks are the reason that I was in Chicago uh that that whole crew are some of my some of my best friends in the world and i love them. can you also tell our listeners a little bit more about the lambda quadrant yes absolutely we are a queer star trek fan group um so uh we do panels and events and uh sometimes we'll raise money for organizations that we love and uh that's that's mostly what we're about just talking about gay stuff and and star trek why is star trek gay all of the reasons why is everyone in star trek gay <laughs> and we'll just leave it there dot dot yep. dot right <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> exactly well thanks so much kelly we really appreciate it and it's been great to have you and we'll have you back again in the future thank you friends yeah, thanks kelly
If you like this episode or other episodes of DC Pride, we love to hear from you. We love to get a five-star rating from you, in fact, on your podcast platform of choice. You can also email us or reach us on social media. You can email us at deepspacepride at gmail.com. And you can also DM us on Twitter and Instagram at Deep Space Pride. And we'll do our darnest to get back to you in a timely fashion. Have a great week and we'll talk to you soon. Bye, everyone. Bye. Deep Space Pride is a production of Coconut Media Works. Executive producers Bill Smith and Dan Davidson. For more great Star Trek discussion, discover the other shows of the Trek Geeks podcast network at trekgeeks.com or find us in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app.